So we're going to talk about gases today. Um, and yeah, it's going to take a uh, all of my voice. There's definitely going to be one word to ask everybody normally. I came with a little bit of chatter, but that's going to be hard for those of you in the back to hear me today. So you'll do all of us a favor. Um, the, uh, I don't have any new quiz questions up here because I just I haven't started grading this week's quiz yet because um, I wanted to get you back your points on the guy on quiz instead. And then I got distracted by somebody's question that asked about um, the scientific frameworks for understanding why consciousness happens. And that led me down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. Um, and I lost you know an hour of my life last night that I was going to spend on grading. Um, I don't mind though, because it was really cool. So, uh, the, it seems like I'll just answer that question a little bit at this point, neurology and what they call consciousness studies is really fields that are truly in their infancy as sciences. They're old, they've only really existed for about the past 30 to 40 years, which is really not very long. When you consider physics has been around since, you know, the ancient Greeks, um, so it's really a new field and there's a lot of kind of sort of competing theories talking about consciousness. The one that seems really interesting and, and seems like a good way of describing consciousness um, that partly explains where it may have come from. It's called attention schema theory, which Um, basically says that consciousness is a sort of a byproduct, C-H-E-M-A, um, of, of an evolutionary tool that was basically a way for animals to sort of integrate current sensory data with memory. So it's pretty obvious why why sensory data, being able to interpret sensory data, would be really helpful from an evolutionary standpoint, right? You're able to see or smell or taste or hear things. You're going to survive longer as an organism, right? Um, but memory is a little bit trickier. Memory is also really helpful as an evolutionary tool, right? Knowing like, oh, that berry that I can see right there looks just like a berry that I ate two weeks ago that made me really sick. I should probably not eat that berry. But the idea that you have both memories and current sensory data and you need to integrate those two is kind of, is what attention schema theory is. And the idea that consciousness is basically you, your brain's awareness of itself within a larger environment. And is that and that kind of arrives rises naturally when you have this this attempt to try and integrate memory and sensory data. So it's it's kind of a a cool idea because if you think about it, that example I just used that very made me sick last week requires your the ability of the brain to understand that berry is the same as the berry in my memory, and two that there's a connection between an acknowledgement that the brain exists and that there's a, a self. So in order to have consciousness, you have to have some, con some um, comprehension of self as being separate from your surroundings, right? So it's not just that berry exists and that berry is bad. It's that berry made me sick. That idea that self exists, me exists, is what consciousness is. And that's really one of the big things that separates human consciousness from other consciousness. But it, it really kind of brings to light the idea that consciousness is not a binary state. Things are not either conscious or not. It's a spectrum. Dogs are conscious, but not as conscious as humans. Most you know, smart dogs have the ability to understand self as being separate from their surroundings. Not all dogs. And not all humans really can understand that, right? It takes humans until about 18 months old before they can comprehend that idea and kind of have that conscious. So humans technically aren't really conscious 
by that by that milestone until they hit about 18 months old. So it's just a really interesting field of study, and they're kind of there's a lot of work to try and tie specific biological things happening in the brain to specific thought patterns or states of mind. And attention schema theory is sort of the, the underlying framework that kind of explains why consciousness might exist in the first place. But it doesn't really explain a lot of the mechanisms yet because memory is really complicated. If you try and look at what's happening biologically when you when you retrieve a memory, it's really, really tricky. It turns out you don't actually recall the same memory every time. Every time you think about a memory, you're actually remembering the last time you remembered that memory. And you get this sort of infinite regression back to, if I'm thinking about what I did when I was five years old, I'm really thinking about the last time I remembered being in kindergarten. And that explains why memories sort of mutate as you get older and kind of like the way you, you keep reinforcing it Eventually, you can convince yourself things happened or didn't happen um, because of the way that works. So with all that in mind, it's really, really complicated to try and explain biochemically how memory works, let alone how consciousness works. But this is sort of our best idea at this point for explaining what's going on. Well, uh, yeah, short-term, long-term memory loss. And so that, that also brings another thing in. So is somebody who has no short-term memory, like, like Guy Pierce in Memento, or um, what's his name in, um, in 51st States, uh, that two-minute Chuck or whatever they call it? 10-second Tom, ten second. Ten second Tom yeah. thank you. Um, like, is that true consciousness? They're not able to actually integrate current sensory data with memory properly anymore, right? And so is, are they truly conscious at that point? And then it becomes more of semantics and... You know, you have to get into the philosophy of it a little bit more, but it is a really interesting field of study right now. And it's it's worth remembering that something like consciousness is not binary, that it is a, a sliding scale. Um, and I think most currently, I believe the most people in these areas actually regard the smarter birds as being conscious almost to the same level as humans, African grace, for instance. Um, have such a wide range of cognitive abilities that mimic people in so many ways, even though their brains are designed, they're not designed, are shaped, and morpholo the morphology is very different, but they have a lot of the same cognitive abilities and memory abilities that people have, um, which is kind of cool. Edward? Oh, yeah, I think it's interesting, though, because like, um, there is like a real-life person who has that Right, but he still like retains a lot of his motor functions and that kind of stuff. So, well, and it, it gets to at the very least that it, it's so in philosophy. There's there's the the concept that that consciousness is, is exists separately from material, so that your consciousness is not tied to your physical brain. It's separate. So, that, effectively, the idea of a soul. Your consciousness is something that is not explained by your brain, but that doesn't actually square with things like um, people that have traumatic brain injuries and how that changes their consciousness, right? There's obviously there's at least a physical component to consciousness because we can change consciousness by things like pharmaceuticals, traumatic brain injuries. So everybody read, taken a, if you've never taken a psych class, you've probably heard this uh, study of Phineas Gage, is that railroad worker? who got a, an iron rod went, uh, I think it was under his chin, and then up out through the top of his head and it changed his personality completely um, because there was some, there must be some physical component to personality and consciousness as well. So it's, it is, it's very interesting, and it's definitely very much in its infancy, and so it's important to sort of separate, this is just one hypothesis that may or may not be all that well supported by evidence at this point, because we're still working out how do we design tests that can prove these things. A lot of you are in a coma. So that's, they actually have a test for that. They actually have a scale that doctors look at that evaluates whether or not they're in a true coma or if they're, there's some like intermediary state and then there's lacking full curiosity or there's some description of, of somebody who's kind of awake but they're not able to actually like explore their surroundings. They're lacking some amount of curiosity and consciousness. So they actually evaluate coma patients on this scale. Like, do they respond? Do they still have reflexes if you hit them on the knee or if you 
you poke them with a needle, do they respond? Some coma patients do, and some coma patients don't, because they are existing on that consciousness spectrum as well. They are just moved further towards the unconscious side um, due to whatever happened to put them in that coma. <clears throat> but anyway, lots more questions you could ask about things like that, and not a whole lot more I can tell you that's actually science based, but it's fun to talk about and think about. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, so this was just a word problem practice for stoichiometry. I think I'm going to leave this for now and we'll go, I'll come up with, I'll write out the solution for it during our break. So if you worked on this over the weekend, you can check your answer. Um, but uh, I'm going to skip ahead for now so we can get right into talking about gases. So the way I'm going to... I'm going to present gases for right now is not the, the only way to think about gases, but for this group coming up on finals week, the way that the most important way to think about gases for right now is we don't have a way yet to describe how many moles of a gas we have, right? We have a way to get to moles of something in terms of, um, in terms of solutions, in terms of solids, we have ways we can get to how many moles we have, right? We don't have a way yet to describe how many moles of gas we have. We need more information. We need to understand what variables are involved in describing gases and how they're related in order to really figure out how many gas molecules we have in this in system. So first off, if we're talking about how many you know, different ways we have to find number of moles. If it's a solution, we have a concentration, right? If it's a liquid and we have a volume, we could use the density to get to grams and then use a molecular weight. If it's a solid, we could just use molecular weight, right? So we have some tools to get there. What's different about gases compared to solids, liquids, or solutions? Go ahead. Get clear. Sometimes gases can have a color though. So I, I guess this is a good time to talk about from a practical point standpoint in chemistry, we need to differentiate between clear versus colorless. Something that is opaque and white could be described as being colorless. It doesn't have color, but it's also not clear. So clear refers to, is it transparent? Can you see through it? Not whether or not it's color. So you can actually have something that is clear and green would mean it was transparent. And so, um, but if we're talking about gas yeah. in general, gases are transparent. Um, so we could call them clear, even though they can have color, but so could solids or liquids. So what's different about a gas? Think about when we first defined, what, what defined a solid versus a liquid? Do li liquids, sorry, I switched tracks. Solids versus liquids, neither of them expands, but the liquid can change shape, right? Liquids have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. So what's different about a gas? There's indefinite volume and indefinite shape, right? In other words, we can't rely on a gas to have a constant concentration or a constant density, because like we saw in lab, you can compress a gas. It's the same number of gas molecules in a smaller volume now, right? And if you think of density, or sorry, as concentration, as being, in general, is it's an amount divided by a volume, right? If you change that volume, you change the, the concentration, right? So in other words, we can't just rely on a concentration if we have a gas. We can't just rely, if we have a liquid or we have a solution, then the concentration or molecular weight and identity is really all we need. That was a big chunk. <clears throat> the, uh, the room across the way used to have air conditioners that stuck out from the sides. Anybody have a class? when that still looked like that and they would the uh, snow would slide off the roof and it would just hammer the air conditioner right next to people's heads uh, it was really startling 
if you weren't more used to it. Um, it's not a massive avalanche on the other side. Yeah, those used to get hung up on air conditioners that were just like window units in A208. It was uh, it was, was kind of entertaining because I could see it happening and then I could watch everybody wake up in the back row. Um, so if gases have a variable volume, volume's part of describing a gas. What's the another variable that we, we talked about in lab? What else is, helps describe a gas? Pressure. Pressure. So at its most basic, what we're, what we're gonna try and do is tie together all the different pieces, all the different variables that can describe a gas and try to relate them to each other in a way that's gonna allow us to calculate a missing variable like say moles. So, and this is, this is just more detail about what we talked about in class pressure is, it's an indirect way of measuring how many gas molecules and what's their average kinetic energy. The problem is this just deals with treating all the entire collection of gas molecules as one object. We're just assuming that they all together have some net force or some, not net force, that has acceleration, um, that they have some collective force when you add them all up. I, but at its most basic, this is this is what we're talking about with pressures. And so when we're going to talk about pressure units now, and again, talked a little bit about that. But if you had um, yesterday, I did not emphasize this. So if you had lab yesterday, your numbers might not have made much sense yet until we start talking about these pressure units. So other than the ones we used in lab today, what other pressure units are there? That you can think of. Newtons, no, wait, no. Pascals. Newtons, Pascals. So we used Pascals, which in the definition of a Pascal was what? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. We're in a physics approach at it. Mm -hmm. Newtons over mm -hmm. meters. Mm -hmm. meters. So basically a force over an area, right? That's a pressure unit. What's another pressure unit that follows that same uh, yeah, right. pounds per square inch? Pounds. So we usually write it as PSI because, because people are allergic to fractions. Uh, but it should be written pounds over square inch. Anybody think of another one that's a force divided by an area? Those are the two big ones, but there's probably some other ones out there. ATM, atmospheric pressure. Oh, ATM. That's more of a definition. So that's the other category of these. Is the first category is basically you take a force unit, you divide it by an area unit. Boom, it's a pressure unit now. Well, of times they're like it's two ATM or five. So that that's our second one is we basically just the other way of uh, writing atmospheric units is we just relate everything back to standard atmospheric conditions. And so that's what one atmosphere is defined as, this is what we're calling average atmospheric pressure at sea level. And so we just say that's one ATM, one atmosphere of pressure. So it's not really a force divided by an area so much as it's just saying, this is normal pressure. Um, it's a little bit like saying, describing speed by saying you went the speed limit. That's not really a speed, right? It's a definition. So these two are kind of, these ones kind of make more intuitive sense. This is more what we consider like physics units, but we like to make things easier on ourselves in chemistry. So we also have these this one especially is the one we're going to always come back to. Let's just call it atmospheres because atmospheres is one atmosphere is really nice and convenient unit to work in. Um, but the nice thing about these is that all five of these are all equivalent to each other. One atmosphere of pressure is equal to, by definition, this is an exact conversion, 760 millimeters of mercury, which also gets written as or T-O-R-R -R, is, is actually in um, 
they've named millimeters of mercury when it's being used as a pressure unit. They named it after a, a uh, an Italian physicist named Torricelli. So T O R R is literally the same thing as millimeters of mercury. And so depending on who you are, how you learned it, what you prefer to describe, how you prefer to write it, you could write either of those units. And anybody in the sciences knows that they're identical. It's like saying cubic centimeters versus milliliters. It's a one-to-one -one conversion. <clears throat> uh, so one atmosphere pressure is exactly equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And both of those are equal to these three up here, 14.7 pounds per square inch is at standard atmospheric pressure at sea level. And a pascal is a lot less than a pound. And a square meter is a lot bigger than a square inch. So there's a lot more pascals than there are pounds per square inch. But these are equivalent to each other. So that means we can actually write any conversions we want. Converting pressure units is really straightforward because they're all defined in terms of standard atmospheric pressure. So anytime you have to convert any app, any pressure unit, all you have to do is go to your list of these and whatever standard atmospheric pressure is in whatever unit you want to be dealing in, use that to make a conversion. So, and so for those of you who are in yesterday's lab, like I said, I didn't emphasize this. We measured our pressure in millimeters of mercury, our barometric pressure. But then our pressure that we added, we put it into, we put the force that we added in terms of newtons, which means our mass had to be in kilograms. And then we divided by square, newtons divided by square meters gives us our pressure added in pascals. So if we wanted to add our barometric pressure, to our added pressure, we either need to convert our pascals to millimeters of mercury or vice versa in order to add them, right? You can't add miles plus kilometers. You have to convert one to the other. It's, but it's a straightforward conversion if you know these, and these are on your conversion sheet as well. Just remember they're all equivalent to each other. Makes it pretty easy conversion, no multi-step pressure conversions. So <clears throat> just for practice, if we measured today's barometric pressure is 608 millimeters of mercury. What is that pressure in atmosphere? What is that pressure in PSI? Work on that real quick. Oh, get it right. So that is pick the unit that you start with that you're going to cancel out, pick the unit that you want to end up in. Like I said, no multi step conversions needed for pressures. We had some, I think this one actually might come out to be exactly 80%. We would get 0 0.800. It really doesn't want to let me write that second zero there. Just remember your sig figs. If we want that in PSI, we can either take the 0.8 atmospheres we just calculated and go atmospheres to PSI, or we could go 608 tor. 608 tor. And for every 760 tor. is 14.7 PSI. You wind up with, what about 12? 11.72. 11.72. 
All right, so a quick note. These ones, these top, the four sobernarian PSI and Pascals, those are measured numbers. Is there a Pascal is defined separately from atmospheric pressure? And PSI, a pound is not defined related to anything um, based on pressure, right? It's the opposite. Pressure is based on the unit of a pound. So these ones are approximate, meaning you need to worry about sig figs. These two, though, are exact. One atmosphere is exactly 760 torr. It's not really, but because at sea level pressure fluctuates on its own, they had to pick a convenient number, so they might as well make one number and call it exactly one atmosphere. Really, if you actually went down to sea level and measured the barometric pressure day to day, it's not always going to be exactly 760 torr. But it's can just convenient to have an exact conversion for something that you can measure directly. Yeah, like weather affects it too, like cold fronts and all that kind of stuff. And that's a little bit of a chicken and egg question too, right? Because is it really that the barometric pressure is affected by weather, or is weather affected by the barometric pressure? And because really most of our, pretty much all of our weather comes from the fact that you have a difference in temperature and a difference in relative humidity in different parts of the world. Parts of the world that are colder versus hotter or have more dense air or less dense air are going to interact with each other. More dense air is going to move towards less dense air to try and even things out, which causes wind. So low pressure system next to a high pressure system, the high pressure system is constantly trying to move into the low pressure system. And by doing that, you get wind. So it's it's an integral part of weather. It's not just that it's affected by weather. It's part of what causes weather is changes in barometric pressure. And that's why you, typically you hear things like when the if the mercury is rising in a, in a barometric pressure, that means that you're going into a high pressure system, which is usually associated with less precipitation, more sun, less cloud cover. Low pressure systems tend to be associated with precipitation and lots of cloud cover and lots of humidity. And so when those things change, you can actually use that specific the part of meteorology is understanding how barometric pressure changes the effect. Ronnie? Go to vibration. Well, so vibration is really temperature is really just vibration at the molecular level, right? You're measuring the average kinetic energy. So yeah, so temperature, as well as these, this difference in densities and barometric pressure, what are gonna cause that, that weather usually. All right. So this is actually the lab that we just did. Let's, let's fill it in as a thought experiment, kind of like we talked about at the beginning of class. If we have a closed system of gas at a constant temperature, and we push on that piston to get to change the volume, the pressure changes, right? Remember that pressure is defined as the force divided by the area. If you compress this, we didn't change the force that all the gas molecules have when they bounce off of things. We just changed how much area that it has, right? So just from a logic point of view, then now we've actually done this test and we actually measured it. We can actually calculate these things. But just from a, a logic point of view, it would make sense if you cut your volume in half. Say if you went from, let's see if I got this in the right order, if I mix it up. Yeah. You cut your volume in half, you cut your area, your surface area in half as well. You cut your surface area in half, your pressure doubles because the force is still a constant. And you can keep doing that and eventually you will wind up an asymptote showing up, right? You could never actually compress this to the point where you got to a volume of zero. And if you did, you would have an infinite pressure, which again, can't exist, right? So the fact that you cannot get to zero kind of makes sense from a physical standpoint as well. And we see the exact opposite when we extend this way, right? If we double the volume, we have twice as much area. 
if we have twice as much area, and when I say area, I mean surface area for the, the gas molecules to bounce into, twice as much area means half the pressure. So you double this number and left that one alone. And, but again, as you keep increasing the volume, you keep doubling, keep doubling, keep doubling, you'll never actually get to zero pressure. And just because I think this is a really cool thing, I already said it to today's lab, but for yesterday's lab, um, if you keep increasing the volume of your system to be the size of the entire known universe, you still don't get to zero pressure. You treat the entire universe like it's one big container of gas molecules, it still has a measurable pressure in deep space because there is nothing you can do to make it so that there are no collisions. There will always be some gas molecules around bouncing off of things. It might be really, really, really small. For instance, when I was in in undergrad, we did some, I did some physical chemistry research where we talked or where we uh, had to get to an ultra high vacuum. We were dealing with a vacuum that was so so big that we, instead of using silicone or rubber gaskets to seal the system, we actually used copper gaskets. Um, you actually had to tighten it down to the point where you created indents in the copper rings, and that's that's how you made an O ring. It was literally out of copper. Um, and we got down to when we had everything sealed up tight. If we had everything running well, we could get down to like ten to the minus eight torr, which is about the pressure of deep space. So think about almost 800 torr is atmospheric pressure. We could get down to 10 to the minus eight. So that's about a trillion times lower. Oh, that's yeah, about a trillion times lower pressure than atmospheric pressure. So we can get to really, really small pressures, but there's still some gas molecules bouncing around, which means there's some measurable amount of force. So what we came up with in lab was effectively that pressure is proportional to one over volume. Meaning when you double pressure, volume gets cut in half. When you double volume, pressure gets cut in half. So when, if they were directly proportional to each other, that would mean that when you double volume, pressure also doubled. We have the opposite, we have the inverse. So pressure is proportional to one over volume, which is why we plotted one over, instead of getting this function, when we plotted it in lab, we plotted pressure versus one over volume, because that allows us to get a straight line. When you get a straight line, the, the statistics works better. <clears throat> um, this, just because it's something that I always thought was really weird to plot something in a graph that has no actual physical meaning. Um, it, it is weird, but the, if you ever have to actually find a linear regression line by hand, a linear regression is complicated enough. Trying to find a function that fits a y equals one over x graph by hand, nearly impossible, and it's not as statistically well supported. Like it, it won't be as trustworthy of a number. So we try to make everything in the sciences when we plot it, we try to plot it in a way that can be linear, which leads to some really weird graphs because you can have something like the vapor pressure above a liquid is equal to, let's see, E to the minus energy of vaporization divided by a, a constant times temperature. So if we actually wanted to plot these variables against each other, you actually have to do something like plot the natural log of the vapor pressure on the y-axis versus one over temperature on the x-axis. And if you do that, you get a straight line. Actually, one's having a negative slope in this case. But it's so it's weird. But it gives us a straight line, which means we can put a trend line in our square value and know how good our data is. Right? So it's more just a tool. It's not like natural log of vapor pressure means anything on its own. It's only useful as a way to get a straight line. Which seemed like cheating to me coming from mostly math classes when I first saw that. Why the heck would we do that? Just because it makes everything work better. 
And if you think that feels like cheating, just wait till you learn what, what the assumptions we're going to make. And when you get to equilibrium, you basically just get to simplify our equation by saying X is really close to zero. So we're going to call it zero in one spot, but not in another spot. And that allows us to solve an equation without it turning into a quadratic and getting a little messy. And it's close enough within sig figs. This one sig figs is your friend and it allows you to discount things that make the math really, really hard. All right. So where we go from here, we figured this out. You might not have thought about writing it that way necessarily. <coughs> but if we, if we think about pressure, it's proportional one over volume. When we, if we look at what proportional means, proportional means that when you have a graph, one over volume versus pressure, that line should go through the origin. It should be a straight line and it should go through the origin. So it shouldn't have an intercept. Our data wasn't perfect from lab. So our equation for this, actually most of them had an intercept that was significant. But for the most part, that's because we just neglected friction. If we didn't neglect friction, we would get it to go right through the origin there. So without knowing what, if we use M to represent the slope, what is the equation of this line gonna look like? What is X plus B? And what is B? Huh? It's what? In, in this case, if it's proportional, means it goes through the origin. So what is B? Zero. Zero. So in other words, the equation for this line is just one over volume equals a constant times pressure, right? Which we can actually just rearrange. So, okay, well, pressure is equal to some constant times one over volume. That just switched the X and Y compared to the way I had it drawn there. But if A is, or M is just some arbitrary constant, it doesn't really matter which means we can rearrange it so that we don't have a one over. We can say pressure times volume equals a constant. And so what this means is that for that system of gas, for those gas molecules at that temperature, any pressure times the volume will equal the same constant. So we can actually just remove that constant. That constant was just the slope of the line. It didn't actually have any meaning inherently to it, right? So we can just say, well, forget about that constant then and just say any combination of pressure times volume is equal to any other combination of pressure times volume. Which seems a little bit weird, but it just, it means that everything is constrained. You can't just change pressure without volume changing corresponding. Right? So that gives us, this is our first, what they call the simple gas laws. This is Boyle's law. Yeah, Boyle's law. And that means that if I give you enough information here, we can calculate whatever missing out of that variable, right? It's just an algebra problem. If I say you have a two liter bottle and it's sealed to 760 torr, what is the pressure if the volume is compressed to 1.65 liters? I gave you three out of the four pieces, right? V1 is 2.0 liters. P1 is 760 torr. P2 is what we're looking for. He says, what is the pressure? V2 is 1.65. Really, really easy algebra, right? We don't even have any pluses and minuses, which is really nice. So we can just plug it in. Then you get 2.0 times liters times seven, let's call that 760 plus or minus one tor equals P2 times 1.65 liters. Two times 760 divided by 1.65, right? 
What happens to our units? Change. We have meters times tor divided by liters, right? Cancels out. So meters cancels out, which is left in tor. And we get what something around 900? 920? So for these simple gas laws, what we're going to find is that it doesn't really matter what pressure units you're in, as long as you're consistent. It doesn't matter what volume units you're in, as long as you're consistent. It would not have changed the math one bit if, if it was two gallons and 1.65 gallons, right? It's still going to be two times 760 divided by 1.65 and gallons cancels gallons. As long as you're consistent with these simple gas laws, it doesn't matter in the slightest what units you pick for pressure and volume. Easy enough, right? Doesn't get us to dealing with moles yet. But we are at least talking about gas molecules. Because what assumptions did we make here? We made the assumption that it's sealed. And we found this with our lab too, right? If you didn't seal your syringe well enough, you let gas molecules out when you apply to pressure, right? And if you don't have a constant number of gas molecules, this doesn't work. And we're also assuming constant temperature. So number of gas molecules should affect pressure, right? Kind of just from a Let's think about the logic here. If pressure is defined as the total force exerted by the gas molecules over the area, changing the volume, change the area. What is changing the gas molecule, the number of gas molecules? What's that going to do? It's not going to change the area, right? It's going to change the force. Yeah, if you, have, if you have twice as many gas molecules, your force should increase, right? Because remember, this is the sum of all the forces. So, and I'm not going to try and write the proper mathematical script on there because I'm going to botch it if I do that. Um, and I don't want to tell you to use the wrong form of, of uh, writing this. But basically, because we're talking about the sum of all the gas molecules, Increasing the number of gas molecules increases the, number, the amount of force. Think about, think about trying to, uh, to knock over one of those weighted milk bottles at a carnival by throwing baseballs at it. Even better, throwing, throwing golf balls at it. You can get a direct hit with a golf ball and not knock it over, right? But if you hit it with three golf balls at the same time, you, that probably would knock it over, wouldn't it? You increase the amount of force just by increasing the number of objects that hit it, right? So force should be related to number of molecules. What's that last variable that we were considering? It was pressure, which we have our definition here. Volume affects area. Number of gas molecules affects force. Mass. Mass. Turns out mass doesn't actually affect anything here because the force is related to mass times the acceleration. And the, the average kinetic energy of these gas molecules is the same regardless of how big the gas molecule is. Number of moles. So number of moles. What's the other thing that could change? So if, if you were gonna change the average kinetic energy, of the gas molecules. What's another way of saying that? What is average kinetic energy? Temperature. Temperature. You increase the temperature without changing the number of moles. Increasing the temperature should increase the force as well, right? Now you have the same number of objects, but you're throwing them harder. Go back to our golf ball and milk bottle analogy. If I'm if I'm firing golf balls out of a potato gun, you know or you know, launching them with a wrist rocket, I can put a lot more force on that milk bottle than I could throwing it by hand, right? I didn't change the number of golf balls this time 
you know, just changed how fast the golf ball was moving. So, more force. so it's changing the force, exactly. So you can increase the force, the average force, by increasing the temperature, decrease the average force by decreasing the temperature. So really we have four variables. They're all kind of interlinked, right? They're all tied to, so pressure is gonna be a result of temperature, volume, and how many molecules you have. So if we did, we did this experiment for pressure and volume, we could do the same thing for pressure and temperature, right? You think about sealing a container and keeping a fixed volume and then increasing the temperature. That's probably not a great idea, right? What's going to happen if you do that? Anybody ever heated a closed system of gas before? It explodes. Yeah, we don't really want to do that. So the test that they actually did when they actually ran these experiments because they looked at the volume changing versus temperature. So basically by having a, a system that's sealed, the piston, and then changing the temperature, they could let the piston move and watch the volume change rather than watching the pressure change because that's a lot safer. And because we know the relationship between pressure and volume, we can still algebraically get back to pressure from here. So what we do is we would expect that, like we talked about, is as you increase temperature, the volume should increase, right? Because you have the same number of molecules, but they're all hitting harder. And that is what we see. The problem is it doesn't go through the origin here, right? But we could get a nice equation for a line, couldn't we? We'd say, okay, well, the volume is equal to some slope times temperature plus a constant. And that works. That's not a great equation, though, because we don't really want to deal with that intercept all the time, right? What are, what are the most troublesome uh, equations and conversions when it comes to keeping track of your sig figs? The ones where you have multiplication and addition, right? So if we can avoid that. That's going to make everything a lot easier. So, why doesn't this go through the origin? What happens to a gas when you cool it down below zero Celsius? It's still a gas, right? This shows that the volume is decreasing, but it doesn't necessarily say that it stops being a gas when you hit zero Celsius. So, we're going to have an intercept because you can get to negative Celsius, right? Well, what if we followed that all the way over? What if instead of saying using zero Celsius, we use something that where you can't get to negative, like right? Fahrenheit? There, you can have negative Fahrenheit, it's lower in temperature, but you can still have negative Fahrenheit, it's Kelvin. So Kelvin is what's called absolute temperature. It's referred to absolute temperature because it can never be negative. Basically, if you follow this, this actually, this experiment is how they first defined Kelvin. They basically got this graph and said, well, we don't want to deal with an intercept. So let's just follow the slope of this line backwards to where it hits zero. Find the x-intercept and call that the origin instead. If you do that, You get it going through the origin as long as our temperature is in Kelvin. So really, this is why Kelvin exists. It's called the absolute scale because when you hit zero Kelvin, there is no colder than zero Kelvin. Think about molecules moving around. Temperature is the average kinetic energy, right? Zero Kelvin is zero kinetic energy. It's where movement stops. And if all movement stops at zero Kelvin, you can't be moving slower than zero, right? So with that in mind, that all of a sudden gets rid of plus V. 
because we just redefined where zero was for X. And that's why the conversion for Celsius to Kelvin is so easy. It's because they didn't change the slope of the line, they just shifted the intercept over. And so, and now if we're in Kelvin, when you double the temperature, you double the pressure or you double the volume. Now it's proportional. Doubling the temperature in Celsius doesn't double the absolute temperature. It does not double the kinet average kinetic energy because you need your origin to be down here for that to work. And so if we do a similar derivation, we can get another, another uh, simple gas law. So if we say volume is equal, to, is proportional to temperature, that's another way of saying volume is equal to a constant times temperature. I think that's K is just the slope. If we rearrange that to solve for the constant, we get volume over temperature equals constant. And then we can do the same thing we did for Boyle's law. Interestingly enough, for the Brooklyn Nine Nine fans out there, there's Boyle's law followed up immediately by Charles' law. I have no idea if Charles Boyle was written with that in mind, but in my in my head it was. Um, it helps me remember their names. There's Boyle's law and Charles. Um, but all this really means is that again, if you have three pieces of this, solving for the fourth is pretty easy. The only trick this time is we do need to worry about units for temperature at least. Volume units still don't matter as long as you're consistent. But your temperature has to be in Kelvin for this to work. There's actually a Fahrenheit equivalent to Kelvin called degrees Rankine. Zero degrees Rankine is zero Kelvin. They both go to absolute zero, but nobody actually uses Rankine because everybody uses Celsius. So it makes more sense to just use Kelvin instead. So. I don't even think it's on your conversion sheet, but you can apply the same logic that they use for Celsius and Kelvin to get absolute temperature in imperial units if you were a glutton for punishment and wanted to do that to yourself. <clears throat> so in order to solve a system like this, a sealed 10 liter system is heated from 22 Celsius to 51 Celsius at a constant pressure. What's the new volume? Make sure that these get put into Kelvin. Plug and chunk. So, again, yeah, kind of useful, but still doesn't really get us to moles yet, and still is only useful in the context of changing an existing system. Uh, so, we've if we solve these, T one is going to be equal to. 22 Celsius, which put it in Kelvin, gives us 295, I think. Yeah, 295 by 15. We're going to keep our uncertainty in the ones place because it was an addition that got us to Kelvin. And T2 is then going to be 324. Plug those in for T1 and T2, plug 10 liters in for volume one, you get volume two. So it's going to be something really close to 10.0. Is it maybe 11? Where are we at? Got uh, 10.0. So just an illustration, we more than doubled the temperature in Celsius, but because we have to put it in Kelvin, doubling Celsius is not the same thing as doubling average kinetic energy, unless you're doubling it in Kelvin. If you went from 22 Kelvin to 51 Kelvin, your volume would more than double. But in this case, we just get about a 10% increase. All right, so before we take a break, I want to go through the last two simple gas laws faster. The first one, like I said, 
Um, if we know what the relationship is between pressure and volume, and we know what the relationship is between volume and temperature, we can actually just use algebra and classical geometry to figure out the relationship between pressure and temperature. But it goes about like we'd expect. If you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure, right? It's the same basic idea. So from classical geometry, you can say if A equals B and B equals C, what do we know about A and C? They're also equal. A version of that that is less commonly used, but very helpful in this case is if A is proportional to B and B is proportional to C, then A is proportional to C as well. So it just means we can do a quick substitution. Say, okay, well, if volume is proportional to temperature and pressure is proportional to one over volume, we can solve, we can rearrange this and plug in, temp, plug this in. We got what's called K Lewis X law, which is pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. Again, all these are on your equation sheet, except I put them in one combined way, and I'll show you why that saves us time and makes sense in a minute. So again, we could do the same thing. I don't think it's that helpful to spend time doing more of these because all that's changing is what variable we're using, right? What units we're looking at. Now we're looking at pressures instead of volumes, but it's the same exact map we just did. Right. Make sure your temperatures are in Kelvin. Plug in what you know. Solve for what you don't. So here's where things really get interesting. Because if we can say volume is proportional to temperature and pressure is proportional to volume, yeah, we can get to P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. But it also means all three of these are related to each other, right? So at this point, the simple gas laws we've been dealing with are just looking at, okay, if the volume is a constant and moles is a constant, then we can say this. But what if you have more than two variables changing at a time? Well, turns out that's actually pretty easy to keep track of as well. Because if you do that same derivation we just looked at, if it's not a constant temperature or a constant pressure or a constant volume, it's still all going to be proportional to each other as long as it's a sealed container. So you basically get one equation that contains all three of the simpler gas laws at the same time, right? Is what happens to this equation if temperature is constant? If temperature one is equal to temperature two, what happens to temperature? Cancels out, right? If we say that this is call this x and call this also x, just multiply both sides by x. X, all the x's drop out of the equation, right? Anything that's a constant on both sides just disappears once you divide both sides, right? So this actually has all three of the other gas laws embedded in it. Just whatever's constant, erase it, cross it out. If we said temperature is a constant and volume is a constant, then that means the pressure must not be changing. Right? Some of these have to change in order for this to work. You can't have everything being held constant or else nothing changes, right? But at the same time, it means that one equation has all of those simple gas laws built into it, which is helpful. And in fact, what is the one thing that's not in this equation yet? What's the one thing that I said had to be kept constant for this to work? Moles of gas. Moles of gas. What would we expect to happen to a pressure? Let's say we had constant volume and temperature. If you doubled the molecules of gas, what should happen to the pressure? It should double. We doubled the number of collisions, right? Which means our total force should double. So we actually should have a way to include, incorporate moles in here too. We would expect moles of gas to be proportional to the volume or pressure, whichever those we want to look at, which means we actually get one gas law to rule them all. 
the combined gas law called Avogadro, uh, Avogadro's law is really this idea. It's actually all the, some of the research that Avogadro did as he was defining Avogadro's number was based on generating a fixed number of gas molecules so that you could run these tests. <laughs> so as long as any one variable is held constant, this has every other simple gas law embedded in it. Whatever is constant, you just cross it off from both sides because it's not changing. So that means we can answer questions like, If we use this, if we had a balloon, and let's assume it's a closed system. Balloons aren't perfectly closed systems, but we can make the assumption it's a closed system, i.e. moles of gas is not changing. We have the initial conditions, and then we have the new conditions. I still have got, I've got to give you five out of the six pieces for this to work, right? And anything that I say is a constant drops off of both sides, so that actually is even easier. It's still just a matter of plug everything in, make sure your units match up on both sides, solve for what you don't know. So in this case, what's the new pressure? You started with 1.05 atmospheres, 22 Celsius and a volume of five liters. Then you increase the temperature and the volume also increases. What's the new pressure on the inside? Well, you're solving for that, we have everything else. The only way that I could really trip you up with this is if I gave you your initial volume in liters and your final volume in gallons. And that's not even that tricky to fix, right? You just have to be paying attention to your units. As long as everything's the same on both sides and your temperature is in Kelvin, these changes are really easy. The last point I'm gonna make before we take our break we're going to come back and practice with the most important version of this. We got to all of these simple gas laws that looked at P1, B1 equals P2, B2 by saying, well, they must all be equal to a constant, right? And as long as, and saying, therefore, before and after have to have the same, the same product. Mm -hmm. If this is every variable that defines a gas, Every variable that defines the gas has to be equal, if you use this ratio, has to be equal to a constant. And what's more is it's the same constant no matter what system of gas you have. So for any system of gas, the pressure times the volume divided by the temperature in Kelvin divided by N, number of moles, is equal to the same constant which is a measurable number. If you have a measurable number, if we can find all these things about a system of gas, we can find what that constant is, right? Which means we don't actually need to just be looking at changes anymore. We can say that for any gas, pressure times volume over moles times temperature is equal to the same constant that we call R. So R is what's called the U the ideal gas constant. Not because this equation is somehow perfect or ideal, but because we're assuming that the gas is ideal. And we'll talk about what that means when we come back. But basically this means if you know pressure, volume, and temperature, you can get moles for any system of gas. If you know moles, temperature, and volume, you can figure out what the pressure is. So we could actually use stoichiometry to figure out how many moles of CO2 are generated from a baking soda in, a, in vinegar equation or reaction, and then figure out at our pressure what the volume of that gas is. So we actually, this gives us a way to turn measurable quantities and get to moles from that. So this is going to be our last way of finding how many moles we have in the systems. It's, if it's a gas, we use this equation, which is usually written in the way that's not a fraction. EV equals NRT. It's written in that order just because they keep everything alphabetical on each side. So R is the constant, N is moles, T is temperature in Kelvin. 
Now, though, we don't have P1 and P2, which means we do need to worry about what our units, but we'll get practice with that. Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back a quarter after and we'll practice using this with some soy geometry. Oh, so the volume is not changing. And if it's sealed, it means the end's not changing, right? So if volume's not changing, the end's not changing, they just disappear. And you get P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So really that two liters doesn't actually have any expression. All that matters is that it's constant. So like it's just a Kelvin then. Yeah, you just gotta put in Kelvin like you're solving for T P2. Okay. Right? Yeah, so you don't oh, use okay. every unit in this case, uh -huh. or every number in this case. Okay. I do it myself. Yeah, to the one, okay? He is actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. An hour. What did you it was already saying, so all we can do is say that I kept the water back. And so I have this humidifier. Oh, so it was just camphor? Camphor, yeah. And so I Not great, but for the most part, it's not that bad. It's not good either. So they told me more than a teaspoon of the size. Yeah. No, no, that was the absolute right thing to do. It's right. It's like, I was like, I didn't even go to class. Watch the kid on them. Yeah, I'm going right. to right. Yeah. yeah, it's not going. Yeah. But not wearing your life. Exactly. Yeah. 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 My attempted to go to me. Okay. It's well, literally back in front. Like, my kids also drew on it. It's okay. Various times. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's the tricky assignment? It takes up a lot of space. Even the easy stuff takes up space, right? It is. Okay. Times, okay. trying to understand it because I wasn't we didn't have class really that because I tried to teach myself on YouTube. Yeah. Tried to study it. And that's it kind of what I was hoping. We, we didn't really add anything. We did like a half lecture on Thursday anyway because I still couldn't talk for more than an hour. Okay. Um so if you're you know, all we did last week was just catch up for me. So that's the perfect thing to do. So okay. yeah. yeah, and so hopefully it makes more making sense. I figured out the tricky one problems, I but a lot of the question and I thought I was getting it, but then for some reason it just wasn't adding out. Well, we're just we're gonna be practice, practicing at it. So there this I think problems seven, eight, nine on the practice are stoichiometry problems. There's a really easy one where it gives you everything in moles and you just go to moles. Mm -hmm. And then there's a yeah. little bit trickier and then a little bit trickier. I think um, that I always make it to the myself too. I've been, so I'm like, I think that I like overthought a bit. It's conceptually, it's really, it's when you get the hang of it, it's like, it's like concepts. I'm like, no way. It's so yeah. simple. Like, okay. it fits on one page. So, but there's, there you go. I'll take it. Sounds good. Thank you. I actually use the number that doesn't give an insult that he is actually not. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's, that could have been my advice. Okay. Um, we'll I just that I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to go back and check. Okay. Because what I'm going to do is I also got to run. Yeah. yeah. So, There's a lot of sick my work. You are sick in places. So as long as I can see you're close to it, it's probably could just be around the people. No. Okay. You got many more. I don't know. It could have been. Yeah. I'll look at your work. Yes. Yeah. And I'll do it too. This this is the, the last new thing we're adding. So no, I remember this from high school. Yeah, and so we'll just practice this. And right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Oh.
But yeah, so we're going to work back this with this and playing into some young trades. We're working together. Okay. And then it's one of those things that you got to practice it enough times that it's like sort of you get it right once and then you're going to cheat it. I mean, I don't know if any off the top of my head, but you could you know, a lot of them, a lot of times you can find them. They might do things a little bit differently. They look a little different than the way you want to look at them. That can use the end of the text. It doesn't have a time because it's a new textbook, it's an open source one, and it's still like moving on problems, but there's at least a few for every topic. Um, and actually, if you want to know which ones are applicable, go to the section of the textbook. Yeah. Um, that has the uh, Go to the section of the textbook that has the topic you're, you're talking about. And they'll usually have, for more practice, look at 17.9 and 17.10. Um, so that's the way to make sure that you're not getting over your head. I don't know if that's the word. Yeah, that's kind of what I was worried about. So, yeah, if you look at maybe an example of problems, um, and I'll, I'm going to pull this up just to show everybody too. In a second. So, yeah, and to me, it's obviously the trickiest one, and, and nothing like that. On the front. But yeah, like I was saying to Ariana, um, number seven, eight, nine, uh, on our tricky object, seven's a really easy one. It's just like the balance is the best one. It's a little bit trickier on the solution that has gas loss in it. And then it's an excess reagent. Where it's like figure out how much of the program is the concentration for the last Friday. That's why he's one of the big units put down the number and no units. That's okay. I mean, that's. A deduction, but it's not that. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I for using most most science textbooks have a similar format with the way that they work with when it comes to um, when it comes to practice problems or example problems. Usually, what you'll see in most modern textbooks is they'll work through an example problem, and then at the end it'll say, "For more practice, look at these at the end of the chapter." So anytime you want extra practice problems on a certain topic, go find that topic in the textbook, find the example problem, and then at the bottom, uh, okay, of course I pick one that doesn't actually say it, um, but usually it will have a list of, of what are other similar problems, but apparently not this textbook yet. So uh, I gave you a piece of advice for other science classes, not for this science class, but at the very least, you can go to that section. So I'm looking at you know, reaction yield 7.4. When you go to the end of the chapter and look at practice problems, um, there's usually going to be something that says like that kind of has them organized by section, like there's 7.1. You want practice for 7.4 and you just go down to the section that says 7.4 and all of the relevant, everything that's in this section, 7.4, is going to be the same topics that were discussed in section 7.4 in the textbook. So use that, use the way that the textbook is designed. Um, you can make sure that you're not getting too over your head 
You're not just picking problems at random from the end of the chapter. Find the ones relevant to the stuff that you really would just pick one at random. Um, and if and again, a lot of times it will actually have them listed with the example problems, but I mix up this textbook with the OCHEM textbook that has them listed differently. Um, so you for this class, just go ahead and look at the sections specifically if you want more practice problems. And I believe I don't actually know if the solutions manual is freely available. Um, but at the very least, if you have, if you want to know if you did the question, the questions right, does it have, it does have solutions at the back, or at least for the odd ones, for the even ones that can help you work through them if you want to double check your answers, right? So you have lots of practice problems if you want them running. Okay, this is another question. Yeah. A different question, I mean. Okay, is any questions about practice problems? Okay, oh, hit me. Oh, wait, never mind. Okay. If he comes back, you just let me know. All right. So here's a, this is a change. For, so the trick with these gas law problems is there, there are really two types. There are change problems where you look at, you're looking at before and after. And in that case, you're going to use the form of the gas law that has P1, V1 over, over N1, T1 equals P2, V2, right? And, and it's the same format for all of them. So the, the combined form, the ideal gas law, the one that you're going to use the most when it comes to stoichiometry is this format. But the other way of writing this is to set, is to solve for R. And then you can look at it like it's a change because you can say P1, V1 over N1, T1, equals R, which also equals any other combination, P2, V2, over N2, T2. So this is the form that's written on your equation sheet, just like this, because that way I don't have to write four different simple gas laws. If you have this, all you need to do is cross off anything that's a constant on both sides. Right, so you look at the set at the question, say, okay, as an initial volume, and then it says it's compressed to a new volume. So volume's changed. We've got a pressure. In, and we can tell because it said one, it says pressure, and the two also from the units, it says atmospheres. It doesn't say anything about moles changing. In fact, the fact is it says it's a sample of gas. And it implies that the number of gas molecules is not changing. It doesn't say anything about temperature. So it's anything that you're not specifically told is changing, you can assume is a constant. So if moles is a constant, boom, cancel out moles. Temperature is a constant because we're not given any information about it. Boom, cancel out temperature. And we're just left with P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Plug it in and solve. Right? But it always comes back to this basic form of the equation, which is really the same as the ideal gas law. Okay. So if we wanted to actually get a number here, we would plug in 13.9 for V1, plug in 1.22 for P P1. Here's our P our volume two, solve for pressure two. Get something like two atmospheres. So 13.9 liters times 1.22 atmospheres divided by 10.3 liters equals P2. And so for any of these changes, like I said, these and these are not really, these are more physics problems than they are chemistry problems. Chemistry is more concerned with what reactions are happening typically. Right? This is describing changes in a system, but nothing's really changing. You just it looks a little bit different. And so 
we don't actually use these as much. They actually show up in the simple gas laws. Turns out if you apply multivariable calculus to them, um, you can actually do some interesting things where you can say, okay, well, the change in volume pushing against the constant pressure is actually energy units. So this is actually where the derivations that led to the internal combustion engine come from. They actually come from these simple gas laws. And then you say, okay, let's take the derivative of the pressure with respect to volume at a constant temperature. And when you do those, some of this calculus with it, you actually wind up with some functions and then you can actually figure out like what's the efficiency that you could get if you're operating an internal combustion engine at these parameters at this temperature, um, which is interesting, but you guys don't have the calculus for it yet. And again, that's more of a physics engineering thing than chemistry. You do learn about it if you take uh, physical chemistry, but we don't need to spend too much time with it. What's more interesting, here's another example of a change. And there's a couple key words that are helpful here. Movable piston, that's a pretty good clue that your volume is going to be changing, right? So we're going to have a sample of gas with moles at a certain volume. An additional moles of volume is added. What's the new volume? Go back to our find equation, cancel out everything that's not relevant, but it's not changing. We know volume is changing. We know that moles is changing. Nothing else is changing. So pressure gets canceled out and temperature gets canceled out. We have V1 over M1 equals V2 over M2. Solve for what you don't have. Right? <clears throat> All right. So the Let's see if I want to get into that yet. Or if we want, yes, we should, we should discuss one more concept. So I mentioned this equation. It says for any gas, this is true. For any closed system, or not even necessarily closed system, for any system of gas, this is true. It does not matter what gas it is, right? Because what's causing the pressure? What is the definition of pressure? Oops. Force over area, right? Well, the force that a molecule exerts is based on how much kinetic energy it has, right? And the kinetic energy of a molecule is proportional to temperature. But it doesn't actually matter what the object is. You can have two very different sized objects with the same kinetic energy, right? Think about trying rolling up a, a, um, a bowling ball versus throwing a baseball. They weigh too, they are very different weights, but you could throw them with the same amount of force, right? If you throw a bowling ball, it's just going to be moving slower to have the same kinetic energy, right? So it really doesn't matter what the gas is, this equation still works. In fact, it also works for combinations of gases because it doesn't matter if you, some of your molecules are CO2 and some of your molecules are oxygen and some of your molecules are nitrogen. As long as they're, if they're all the same temperature, they all have the same average kinetic energy. It's not related to velocity, it's related to kinetic energy which has a mass and velocity term in it. So it doesn't really make a difference what they are. So another good example, a visual example for thinking about gases is if you have a moving box full of ping pong balls and you kind of just shake it. The amount that you're shaking it is gonna give all of the ping pong balls some kinetic energy, right? Some of them may be moving faster than others, but there's gonna be an average kinetic energy. If I replace some of those ping pong balls with ball bearings, and shake it the same amount, the ball bearings aren't going to move the same way as the ping pong balls, but they're going to have the same amount of average kinetic energy, right? They're still going to move with the same amount of force, even though they're bigger or they're, they're heavier. Anyway. 
right? So with that in mind, it really, when we have a mixture of gases, we can actually just treat them like they're not interacting with each other at all. Because for the most part, they aren't. For the most part, most gases are 99.999% empty space. So it doesn't really matter what the molecules are because for the most part, they're just bouncing around, bouncing off the walls of the container. And they're gonna, as long as they're the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy, regardless of how heavy they are. Right? So if we had a system that has two atmospheres of helium and another system that has four atmospheres of argon and we mix them together, our total pressure is just literally add the two separate pressures together. All that changed because the helium and the neon or in the argon aren't really interacting with each other, you just treat them like they're they're the same, the same molecule for all intents and purposes. Okay. So this means we can actually get systems where we have a combination. If we make, say we have a combustion reaction and we're making gaseous water and gaseous CO2, we can get a total pressure at the end of that whole system by saying, okay, I made this many molecules of water. And this many moles of, of CO2. So my total pressure is now this, just by adding up moles of CO2 and moles of water. So for the most part, it doesn't matter what these molecules are. And so just because before we start using practice, I want to talk about this equation one more time. I mentioned this is called the ideal gas law. And it's it's not ideal in quotes and then gas law, it's ideal gas law. It's the law for an ideal gas. An ideal gas has two main characteristics. And those characteristics will tell us where this fails. The, the two main assumptions we're making when we say something, um, when we say something is an ideal gas or behaves like an ideal gas, we're making the assumption that those molecules don't interact with each other, like we were just talking about. They're totally separate. They have no interaction with each other. So molecules don't interact. And more physics, mathematically, we can say we're assuming that all collisions are elastic collisions. We're assuming that when these things bump into each other, they bounce off like billiard balls, not that they would hit, they would hit each other and stick. That there is no attractive force between them, which also means that you have no phase changes. Right? Because if there's no attractive force between the molecules, then that means that you can never make a liquid out of them because there's no attractive force to hold the molecules together to make a liquid. So this is part of the same assumption, which means we're basically ignoring the fact that we could actually have something else happening. So like if we had a system of water molecules in the gas phase and we cooled them down below the boiling point of water, they're not just going to change volume as a gas, they're actually going to condense and turn into a liquid, which means this doesn't work anymore. This only works with gases. So we can only use this equation or any of these gas laws equations if we don't have a change in, in phase. Excuse me. The other assumption we're making is that the gas molecules are infinitesimally small. In other words, the gas molecules don't take up any space themselves. What that means is basically that we don't need to worry about the fact that a change number of gas molecules that actually changes how much open space there is for everything else. And we're assuming infinitely small. We're assuming these molecules take up no space. So the total volume of the container is the total volume for all of the other gas molecules to move around in. 
we're basically ignoring the fact that really, yes, they're tiny, but they do actually take up some space. So these two assumptions do fall apart under certain conditions. Under normal Earth-like conditions, these are good assumptions for most gases. Unless there's a phase change, or unless you get to the point where you actually have so many gas molecules in such a small space that they are actually taking up a measurable amount of your container. If you think about taking our syringe and compressing it down to the point where all of those gas molecules were right next to each other, we were half, you know, say half of your total volume was actually taken up by the gas molecules. The other gas molecules aren't free to move wherever they want, right? Because now they have to worry about bumping into other gas molecules. If they're bumping into other gas molecules, they don't have the full volume to work with, which means this equation doesn't work as well. So at really high temperatures and pressures, especially pressures, really small volumes, then this equation breaks down. The other place that it breaks down is if you have polar molecules. If you have molecules that have significant interactions with each other, then assumption one falls apart. You can start to have phase changes. At the very least, when these things bounce into each other, they don't bounce off like billiard balls. It'd be more like if you threw two beanbags at each other. They might not stick together, but they're definitely not going to bounce off perfectly in the opposite directions, right? When you have those sort of interactions, a significant number of them, then assumption one falls apart. And so there's actually a more complicated version of this equation um, that we're not going to spend too much time with. I'll show it to you on Thursday, um, and it'll be in one of the take-home problems. We'll, you will have to actually use this more complicated version that actually corrects for these problem is it's really, really hard to use mathematically as it, inter it introduces, um, if you're solving for the wrong variable, you can wind up having to solve for a quadratic, using quadratic equation. And plus it also doesn't handle mixtures of gases as well. You have to look up individual parameters for every gas. And then you have to look up a specific parameter for water mixed with oxygen. It's gonna behave differently than water by itself in this other equation. So not nearly as useful, really only useful when one of these falls apart or if you need extra sig things for whatever reason. For the most part, this is the most important gas law that we have in this class because it lets us get from measurable quantities like pressure, volume, and temperature and get to moles from them. All right, so the last thing we're going to do here, I think that was the last slide. Let me double check that, I guess. Oh, there we go. Perfect. We have a practice problem here. <laughs> so here's one way to incorporate stoichiometry. If we have stoichiometry, this is a reaction you have, um, called a syngas reaction. You have carbon monoxide and hydrogen. You can make methanol with it. Start with two gases and you're making one gas. And you need to balance this but we can actually figure out how many moles we started with and how many moles we're gonna end with. And therefore, what's our final pressure? Our goal here is to figure out the final pressure of the system. Do you have a question? So I'll give you a couple minutes to think that through. Work, work with each other. On the first step of any stoichiometry problem, make sure it's balanced. Second step, put whatever you have in moles. And see if you can figure out where you go from there. Thank you. 
Well, I sure would see that. So we're started, we started with everything in grams. So that means we're just using molecular weight to get to moles. So what do we get for a number? Or this should be really close to two and a half, right? Two point one is one eight one. Four eight one? Yeah. And then what about carbon monoxide? One point. <laughs> All right. So now to clear space, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the white white screen and rewrite this. All right, so the question was, what's our final pressure when everything is done? Said assume constant volume, and said assume constant temperature. So out of our change equation, we could say certain things were gonna be constant, right? Okay, so P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. And like we said before, anything that's constant gets canceled out. So we know moles is not constant because we have a reaction happening. Temperature. Pressure is what we're trying to find. Temperature and volume are constant. So we wind up with P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. So we know P1, 1.51 atmospheres. That was a given, right? Yes. We can find N1, because we can assume, if you're not told otherwise, you can assume that all of the gas molecules to start with are our reactants that are given. Mm -hmm. So we can find N1. We have P1. We want to find N2, which is your total molecules when the reaction is done. 
And if we if we have M2, then we can get B2 pretty easily, right? So basically, this is a combination stoichiometry problem. It's a, both an excess reactant problem and a theoretical yield problem, right? We got to know what's going to be left over. We want to know the total moles at the end. So we need to find how many moles are left over of whatever our, our excess reactant is. And we need to know how many moles of product we're making. <clears throat> All right, so this is actually one place where you can do this a different way. There's lots of ways you could do this. You could figure out, okay, you might be able to look at this and see the two to one ratio, realize this is more than double that, and be able to just look at it and tell what's going to run out first. Um, it's still, it's probably a good idea to show your work since these aren't that friendly of numbers. You could easily make, you know, make a mistake that way. But we know how to show a limiting reactant, right? And so we could rewrite write it that way. <clears throat> um, and just say, okay, well, I'm pretty sure carbon monoxide is running out first. Because I'm pretty sure that this is less than half of that. But either way, if we want to show the work, we say, okay, 1.231 moles CO. And for every one mole of CO, is two moles of hydrogen used. We have more than that, right? We have more than that, and we know that Yes, we get to use up all of our carbon monoxide. <clears throat> Once we know what the limiting reactant is, and this is, and this is a tool that will be really helpful when you start talking about equilibrium, but it's still a really useful tool for keeping track of multiple things that are changing in a reaction. Um, and goes to somebody's question from the quiz. I just glanced at a few of the questions. Somebody's question was, um, how do you keep your systems of equations straight when it comes to stoichiometry? This tool that I'm going to show you right now is actually a really good way to keep track of what's going on when you have more than one thing changing at a time. And so I'm going to actually just erase this right now. Normally I would still leave that on my paper so that I could make, so I could say I know what the limiting reactant is, I proved what the limiting reactant is. Um, so I'm going to use what's called an ICE table. ICE stands for initial change and end. Basically, it's just, it's exactly what it sounds like. We're just going to make a list of what we have at the beginning. And I just always line it up underneath the reaction, underneath the balanced reaction. When you have moles of something, you write an ice stick and write an ice table with it. Say, okay, initially, I have 1.231 moles of carbon monoxide, 2.481 moles of hydrogen, and zero moles of product. This wouldn't actually change if I actually had product in there to begin with. I would just fill in a number here right, instead of having zero. The next row is change. And change is, like I said, it's exactly what it sounds like. And a lot of times what we'll do is rather than actually put a number in here, we'll represent all of this row with a variable. So X makes the most sense. And the reason that's helpful is because, okay, if I'm using, if I'm using something up, it's a negative number and it's some value X. How much hydrogen am I using in terms of X? One, it's still a reactant, so it's still a negative. We're still using it up, right? If I'm using X moles of carbon monoxide, how many moles of hydrogen am I using? Two X. And our product over here, it starts with zero. We're making some product. How much product are we making? X. And it's going to be plus, right? 
So the last row, the E endpoint is just add up what's right above it. At the end, you're going to have 1.231 moles minus X moles and 2.481 moles minus 2X. And at the end, we're going to wind up with X right there. So because this is balanced and because we plugged in our coefficients here, this is actually a real, this is really three algebra equations in a row that all have the same variable, right? So as long as we can find X somehow, we can fill in our final concentration of everything pretty easily. So what is X in this case? We already actually figured it out. Yeah, we're using up all of our carbon monoxide, right? That's our limiting reactant. So that means this has to equal zero. In other words, X is 1.231. So that allows us to say, okay, well that, we're gonna make 1.231 moles here. We're gonna have zero moles of that left. And 2.481 minus 2X, you just do the algebra there, or the arithmetic there. What is it? Oh, get it right. It's going to be zero point, it was, 2X is 2.462, right? So, 1.9 maybe, did I forget to borrow? Doing subtraction mentally was the hardest thing for me. Right, so all this ice table did, it's nothing that you can't do by hand, right? I mean, I was a series of conversions and subtraction problems. It just organizes it away in a way that makes it really obvious that all of these changes are tied to each other. So if we had something that was trickier, that was maybe not just a one-to-one -one ratio or something like that, um, when you, this is really helpful in equilibrium because in, when we start talking about equilibrium, we don't assume that anything goes to completion. We wind up finding that it stops at a certain point. And so finding X is not as simple as just doing a theoretical yield like we did. But it's still a really good way to organize your thoughts. So just to finish this up, I know we're about out of time. Our initial moles, M1, is going to be what? One point two three one plus two point four eight four eight one, right? So what that comes out to be three three point seven one two. And two at the end, our total number of moles is one point two three one plus point one nine. 0.019. I so 1.250. Yeah. P1 was given 1.51 atmospheres, right? So once again, we have three out of the four pieces. Solve for P2. We get a number that's roughly a third of what we started with, something close to 0.5. What do we get when we plug everything in and solve it? Just so everybody has some closure before we're done for the day. Right, so 
This is one way that stoichiometry factors into gases, just because if you're changing the number of moles with a chemical reaction, especially moles of gas, then we actually have the tools to be able to figure that out. The easiest way to incorporate these and the way that's on the test in the practice test is basically, if I give you a pressure, volume, and temperature, you just use the ideal gas law to figure out N. Or if you use a theoretical yield to figure out moles of N, figure out your final pressure or your final volume of the gas based on how many moles of product you can make. Okay, so, but it's always just recognize your variables in your units, make sure your units are consistent, and just stoichiometry. Sometimes you can write it in a complicated way, but it's still just stoichiometry. How much did I use up? How much is left? Okay, so more practice with this on Thursday. And that's our last topics that we're adding. Um, it's going to be just practice with this, and then I'll show you that Van der Waals equation, the complicated version of it, so that you've seen it once. Okay. Wait, so I don't know.